Canada plans to ban single-use plastics by 2021, and over a million protesters gather in Hong Kong. I'm Marco Perry. Welcome to the Perry Platform. Today is a pretty big day for the environment. The Canadian government has committed to banning single-use plastics by 2021. If you haven't checked, that's in only two years. According to CBC, the list of banned plastics include plastic straws, cotton swabs, drink stirrers. Wow, that felt pretty awkward saying that. So next thing, plates, cutlery, and some plastic bags. This move is a component in a larger climate action plan that's trying to tackle the plastic pollution that has plagued not only the oceans, but also landfills. It's also said that Canada is looking towards the EU in terms of what to include in the list of bans and what to allow within these new legislations. For example, the EU voted to also rid themselves of something called oxo-degradable plastics. That term refers to plastics that include additives which do not completely biodegrade. So, plastic without additives already takes an extremely long amount of time to decompose. In some cases, those plastic bags we throw out, they can sit in landfills for up to a thousand years. Let that number sink in. Your great, 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 and probably many more greats after that, ancestors can hold a plastic water bottle that you put your lips on. It's like an antique of some sort. Wood products that contain the additive, well, it's even worse because the additive never fully biodegrades and instead it just fragments into small pieces and it remains in the environment for, well, you could say eternity. If you have enough of those things lingering around, it can cause major space issues and we simply don't have the room to accommodate for an influx of things that will never disappear. The EU will serve as an example for Canada as we look to traverse through these rather obscure policies and figure out the best way forward for ourselves. Canada is also taking initiative in terms of handling ocean plastics. Litter that seeps into the oceans, well, it has some really dire consequences not only for marine life, which sometimes die by eating plastics or even getting caught up in garbage, suffocating, ingesting it by accident and they choke, but it also has an adverse effect on us. The fish that now live in extremely disgusting conditions, well, it's the same fish we eat. It's probably not the best idea to be poisoning one of our sources of nutrition. France, Germany, Italy, the UK, and other parts of the EU signed on to work collaboratively with Canada to find ways to clean the water and better protect the marine habitats there. One thing that added to the motivation of Canada to get this plan going was the fact that Canadians themselves, well, were not really the best when it comes to handling our waste. Actually, that just reminded me of a story we covered recently about Canada shipping off some of their garbage to the Philippines. Now, keep in mind, it was not the Canadian government who was dumping their trash in a developing country. Instead, it was a private company who was doing it instead. But it still reflected terribly on Canada as a whole. But enough of that. In terms of a more relatable fact, Deloitte, a major firm, ran a consultation and they found that in 2016, only 9% of plastic waste was recycled in Canada, with 87% going into landfills. Those numbers are just not sustainable, and we are on a path to either overflowing our landfills, resulting in the need for expansion, or, as what happened before, trying to find ways to outsource our crap because we just can't hold on to it anymore. Another stat that might blow your mind comes from Environment and Climate Change Canada. They report that Canadians throw away more than 34 million plastic bags every day. Given our total population, it works out to be roughly one per person per day. That ends up being problematic because as I mentioned before, they take forever to decompose and secondly, they spread all across the world and often destroy wildlife habitats where they are disposed of. I also found it very odd that the same study reports that Canadian recycling industry generates about $350 million, but it only employs about 500 people. That itself is so mind-boggling. An entire industry, a massive one, one that can pave the path to a more sustainable future, only employs 500 people? That's crazy. It's absolutely minuscule, and it's not conductive of a progressive type of system that we need to be having right now. The Canadian government made it a point 
to also explain that this new strategy will generate jobs and reduce greenhouse gases. So I have two points about that. The first is the emissions portion. Well, that's most likely to be true. But the second, the point about jobs, well, I find that rather hard to believe. And it sounds like they're just trying to score a quick political jab at their opponents. An industry of multi-usage products will arise to replace plastics in Canada. So you'll get jobs from there. But at the same time, you are also destroying another industry. Rightfully in this case, the plastics and single-use market. But it's not like you're creating a surplus of jobs. It appears to be more of a cannibalization to me as opposed to growth. Simply, it's the same number of jobs or at the very least a comparable number and simply a transition from one place to another. It's not like they're both going to stay and increase together. That itself does not take away from the moving being overall positive for us as Canadians and the world at large. But these politicians need a reality check sometimes. Making empty promises like this should not be heralded as a job boosting policy because that's not even within the top 10 positive effects of the policy. It's a tremendous reach and I really wish that they would just stay away from the BS and keep the matter strictly to the facts. It will make things a lot easier to digest and it will get rid of this veil of nonsense that seems to be covering almost everything political these days. Despite that, I'm happy that we're making strides to eliminate one of the most wasteful practices of all humanity. Logically, it does not make sense to have an item that is so indestructible it can even last for centuries, being utilized only one time and then discarded into a plot of land to just sit for a thousand years. It's either you recycle and repurpose the plastics into new products or you simply just get more usage out of them so you're not increasing production needlessly. We probably have enough plastic thrown out around the world to satisfy our plastic needs for quite some time, but it's a shame we're not taking advantage of that. It's a missed opportunity and maybe only having 500 people working in the industry is limiting what we can do. This realization was interesting to me because I feel like most people would agree with this, but sometimes agreement does not always equate to action. Maybe it's because we've become too accustomed to these habits or maybe because we just don't know how to adapt. Now that the government has put a time limit on the process, it gives us the incentive to start exploring the idea of sustainability just a little bit further. It also signals to the market that they need to figure out how they're going to change their processes so when the time comes, consumers are not going to be turned off by inconvenience. Two years is not the largest amount of time, but then again, this really isn't rocket science. I fully expect human innovation to figure out a more eco-friendly path forward, and we've already seen that already happening. Look at chat time, for example a very popular bubble tea joint. They've already phased out some of their plastic straws and they're pushing people to purchase a metal one that's reusable. I believe it's like $5, but if you buy that, I think they offer you a discount on bubble tea or something. They're giving consumers an incentive to adopt these more sustainable practices and it's good. It's getting more people to be aware of that. A lot of even cafes have phased out plastic straws already. It's not like they're dropping the bomb on companies and forcing them to adapt without no prior knowledge of how to do so. Companies are already doing it. Like, there are these paper straws. I'll, I'll give them this though. It does taste terrible when it gets soggy, but drink your stuff fast and it's about the same. So, point being, there's ways to get around this, and the government's basically saying, do it fast. I have no problem with that. I'm all for this move, and I believe it has the potential to be a massive game changer in the world of environmental redemption. At the same time, I'm pretty hyped up to see just what the market adapts to. I think it will be pretty cool to see what the future holds for us now. So, good job Trudeau. This is one of the best moves as of late that you've made. Kudos to you. Now we're going to transition across the sea over to some news about Hong Kong. And trust me, it's very applicable and very interesting. Over 1 million protesters, and yes, you heard that number right. One million people took to the streets of Hong Kong on Sunday to oppose a controversial extradition bill. The bill was delegated from China and would enable them to extradite fugitives from the city. In case you weren't aware before, Hong Kong has a separate government and economic system from the People's Republic of China. 
Hong Kong used to be a British colony, and since they were reclaimed by China, they've been treated as a special administrative region. Hong Kong has seen pressure from its citizens to maintain separation from China, but at the same time, China is applying the opposite force as they try to incorporate Hong Kong into the fold. There are a lot of complexities with the issue along with that, but that's just a quick synopsis of it in a nutshell. This new extradition law would make it easier for China to pluck citizens out of Hong Kong to face legal consequences for their quote-unquote crimes. Those who oppose the bill in Hong Kong cite one major concern, which is the difference between the two regions' perceptions of legality. They fear China may extradite democracy activists, journalists, and foreign business owners even. This was the largest gathering of protesters since the city was handed over to China in 1997. There's always been tension between the two parties, and this is just another development in that saga. Keep in mind, the entire city has a population of about 7.5 million people. It's rare to see citizens united in these large numbers publicly. You probably even have more people who oppose the bill who didn't make it to the protest, so it's really giving a clear message that they do not like this bill. The citizens want to maintain their autonomous legal system, and this new bill puts them at risk of a hostile takeover. The Chinese government's stance is that this move is to plug loopholes and allow Hong Kong to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not to send fugitives to the territories where it does not have formal extradition deals. For example, Taiwan and mainland China. Now before I progress, I just want to point out one very, you could say, interesting tidbit of information. The person in charge of deciding who would get extradited in Hong Kong, they are appointed by the Chinese government. So that's a big red flag already right there. There are times though when a policy like that, an extradition agreement, would be quite helpful. For example, they cited this one instance where there was a murder case in Hong Kong. There was a person who was traveling with his girlfriend and the individual killed her and he was forced to receive justice in Hong Kong instead of being extradited back to Taiwan they were Taiwanese citizens so that's an area where you could see why it would be helpful to have a policy like that. Hong Kong had to handle the issue despite it allegedly having to do with a Taiwan citizen. Taiwan wanted to deal justice themselves because it was their person it was their citizen responsible. Another thing that is making people uncomfortable about this move is that lawmakers have said that a guarantee of a fair trial will not be written into the bill. Surprise, surprise. Already off to a very bad precedent with that one. Yet another reason why people are against that is because there's a loophole has existed for 20 years already and people do not see why a rush job with a policy that's for the most part riddled with uncertainty should just be accepted. In my opinion, it's a very interesting proposal because it's wrapped in a shroud of virtue. We want to be able to extract people like this case of murder over here. The example, as I mentioned, is from a couple who was traveling and the boyfriend killed his girlfriend in a different country. It's not like the person is getting off free though. They're still going to face justice, just in a different location, with a different set of standards. And this different set of standards is really incredibly important in the case of China versus Hong Kong. The Chinese government is not structured like Western democracies, so we have to take that image out of our head. Not every country has the same structure that we do, and in this case, it is a detriment. The justice system in China is not totally independent. It's mostly at the control of the ruling Communist Party. Now, you take a system that is riddled with political agendas, and you expect it not to manifest in a political maneuver? One reason extradition treaty between places like Canada and the US are successful is because of the separation of powers that we have. The courts are supposed to act in the name of justice and not bend to the political whims of the ruling party. It's even written within the very treaties themselves that extradition is not permitted based solely on political grounds. It's not supposed to be a tool or a weapon used against another party. The people of Hong Kong understand that reality and that is why we've seen the country's biggest demonstration of protesters since 1997. We're all really playing the same game here, but not with the same set of rules. 
we're bound by checkers, while China has the mobility of chess. They can do as they please with their structures of power because that's how they're set up, and it's an important distinction to make when you analyze this case. Tension is raising between these two forces, China and Hong Kong, and I'm really left wondering what's going to come of it. In the past, protests were extremely more powerful and effective at persuading leaders because the threat of violent revolt always hung in the air. But in this case, there's not much pressure Hong Kong can put up. They are just a fraction of China's total populace. Now, there's a second point. Protests are very effective because the ruling party starts to fear for their jobs. If enough people are mad at you, well, it's very unlikely that you get enough votes to get another term. But look at this. It's the same game, but the rules are different. China does not have to deal with that because they are not a democracy. The people do not vote them into power. It's a niche group of people who control the government and they control the country. All you have to do is appease that small circle and you can do practically whatever you want because the people, they don't have a voice. And that's one of the reasons why voting, expressing your opinion, and having an educated stance on what's happening in politics is so important because it's a right that's given to you and we're lucky to have it. Or otherwise we'd be in a situation like China over here where they're doing whatever they want and they're not really being held accountable to anyone or anything. A strong arm approach from China would be nearly impossible to resist. Then there's also the possibility that China doesn't really even need this bill to pass. If the actual aim is taking people they don't like, or even criminals for that matter, to trial, they can simply kidnap and make those people disappear. Because the justice system works for you, well you can make anything you want legal, so it's all good. It's a major flaw of their system, but it has pros and cons. The pros are you can do fast policies, you can move quickly, you can adapt, but at the same time, it has a high tendency to spiral into tyranny. We're kind of seeing the aftermath of that right now. Hong Kong's resistance is encouraging, but the rest of the world really needs to keep their eyes on this because it has all the makings of a disaster. If the resistance continues to deny China, there's no telling how critical the situation could become. We've seen in the past, China doesn't really have a problem using force to pave the way for their notions. The time and square situation comes to mind, and we do not want a repeat of that. I also think Hong Kong has very solid ground for now wanting this based on what they've mentioned, the possibility of targeting democratic activists. So, what's one thing the Communist Party fears? It's a change in mindsets and it's access to information. That's why in China, a lot of things are banned. The Washington Post, Facebook, a lot of social media, it's censored. There's no flow of ideology and they don't want the people becoming educated and aware of the other options available to them. Because once the populace joins together and they want something, well, now they can overthrow you. But if all they know is what you've presented to them, if they have one notion in mind, they're going to be okay with that because they don't know what's on the other side of the barrier. They don't even know to think of it as an improvement. But you have those within China itself, within Hong Kong, who are actively voicing their dismay for the current system and they're telling people, hey, this whole democracy thing, it's actually a good idea. It gives us power. There's some cons to it as well, but it might be the best system we have at our disposal. That's not going to go too well with China who wants to preserve their current way of operating. Now, I'm not saying that's the case with absolute certainty, but it's something to consider when you're debating whether or not to pass this bill. You have to also look at the bill within context of the world as it is right now. If you pass the bill solely on its merit, well then you're a fool, because the merit is there for sure. The merit's there with a lot of things because it can be positioned to appear that way. They've given a solid case. There was this couple who was traveling, and the boyfriend freaked out, killed the girlfriend, he's crazy. Now we want to extradite him, but we can't because the law does not let you. Well, we should change the law. Let that happen. But, okay, that's logical, fine. Look at the other things that are at play here though. First of all, it wasn't even mainland China involved in the case that they're bringing up. There are our ulterior motives, and it's your job as a politician to figure that out and do what's best for the people. The standards might be different over there, but at the crux of the issue, that's what Hong Kong is trying to do. I'm an avid believer in Western democracy and all the positives that come from that. 
So it's amazing to me that Hong Kong is trying to withhold some semblance of that, and it's troubling that China appears to be coming down on them. So we'll see how that transpires. Well, that's about it for today. Thanks for joining me on the Perry Platform. If you enjoyed the content, be sure to leave a review and follow me on Twitter at Perry Platform. I'll see you soon.